Holy Comet, Spock! Hey there, Penguin Trekkies! Out there, your little Trekkie Penguin, Bob here! And I want to talk about the second episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The Children of the Comet. So, let's get ready, all you Penguin Trekkies out there. Set your phasers to maximum, set a course to Persephone 3, Warp Factor 2, and hit it! So let's talk about Holy Comet Spock! Stay tuned! You don't want to miss this! So, I want to spend a few minutes discussing my thoughts and observations on what happened in the episode Children of the Comet. Spoiler! If you have not seen the second episode of Strange New Worlds, this is your warning. We will be discussing the events of this episode in detail, so you have been warned. Anyway, much of this episode, to me, feels like it's about Ahura, Cadet Ahura, and also about her interactions and mentoring from Spock. I do like how it gives a bit more background to such a beloved character uh, from Trek franchise, Ahura, and we get to explore that more of her background in this episode. From the start, we see Cadet Ahura has been invited to have dinner with Captain Pike and also senior officers, because according to Cortez, Captain Pike likes to interact and talk with all his crew and hear their thoughts rather than just listening to only his senior officer's command staff. Ahura gets hazed by Cortez because she's told to dress up in full dress uniform to what is a very informal dinner with Captain Pike and crew. Seen by when we enter the door, you see Pike standing there in an apron. And he has to go tend to the barbecue ribs apparently he's making. Sounds yummy. Anyway, I really like Captain Pike's feel here. He's laid back in his leadership style. He is very much a listener type style of leadership, which to me is essential in leadership period. No matter if you're a captain or just a, a leader of industry or anything. Because if the leader doesn't listen to those he leads and use that information to inform his leadership decisions, then he might as well be taking a walk because he won't have anyone following him. Pike continues to show his leadership style in this series so far, that he is a leader, not because he has the rank of captain, but because he understands what leadership is. And Pike is still being the leader that he needs to be regardless of the undertone of the whole series, that he has this knowledge of his imminent future. Think back on uh, in the Discovery when he went to uh, Borath. His first officer, Una, throughout this whole series, is very in tune with Pike's feelings about this. She kind of reads in between the lines, and she takes several opportunities in, the ep in this episode in particular to talk with Pike about his future, and that she feels that maybe it's not as set in stone as he thinks it might be. So, anyway... The Enterprise in this episode is on its way to Persephone 3, an M-class planet home to a pre-warp society called the Deleb, where they discover a comet is on course to strike the planet and cause an ELE, or an extinction, uh, extinction life event, basically to wipe out the inhabitants of that planet. So even though... Starfleet is not about interfering with pre-warp societies. They also aren't going to let people just die. So Pike decides that he needs the options to nudge the comet's course so it won't strike the planet, and the crew devises a plan to use four ion engines launched by modified photon torpedoes. Then these torpedoes, when they hit the comet, are actually stopped by a force field, which is that means this is not no ordinary comet. Pike sends a landing party down to the comet containing Spock, Uhura, Sam, Kirk, and La'an. So we get to see the landing party in EVA suits here as they walk into the transporters 
which I do like the new EVA suits. They're kind of cool looking. They do seem like they're not as restrictive in movement. However, one thing I don't like is their helmets seem to be a bit snug for my liking. Anyway, the land party then find, lands down on the comet and finds a cave on the comet with a giant space egg that has alien writing and markings on it. And Sam Kirk and Ahura start talking about those writings and they try to figure them out. And Sam reminds Ahura that she's the linguist. You know, she speaks 37 languages, we found out during the dinner party. So Sam touches the egg to try to maybe figure out a little bit more about the writings. In the meantime, Spock notices that there's a high energy buildup and release, which hits Sam and knocks him back and stops his heart. Of course, the comet then raises its force field and the land party is stuck there. They can't contact or beam back to the ship. Uh, one thing I did kind of notice that was cool in this episode, uh, other than the fact that the tricorders kind of still look like TOS, which is great, I think. Uh, it's, it's giving that same TOS look and feel to the phasers and tricorders and equipment they carry. There's also, I noticed that there was a setting on the science officer, you know, aka Spock's tricorder for a defibrillator mode. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, that's not a medical tricorder. Yeah, but you forget also in Star Trek, the science, in the lack of a medical officer on the lamp landing party, in this case they don't have one, the science officer fills that role as well. So it is very possible he could have a defibrillator mode on his particular tricorder. So he uses that defibrillator mode to start Sam's heart again to get him stable enough until they can get back to the ship. Meanwhile, we find out about a race called the Shepherds who attacked the Enterprise protecting the comet. They believe this comet is, is called Mahadat, the Arbiter of Life, a.k.a. they believe the comet is sacred. A holy comet. Holy comet, Spock! Anyway, so this is where Spock spends some time mentoring and validating Ahura, kind of giving her a pep talk to convince her that she's able to figure out these writings. Because he feels like that if we figure out the writings, that they can possibly get the force field down and get out of there. Ahura doesn't feel like she's up to the task because she mentioned in the dinner party, she's not even sure she wants to be in Starfleet or they, she feels like she's even qualified to be there since she's only a cadet. So Spock spent some time mentoring and also I feel like kind of a little bit validating her, which I don't necessarily like, but at the same time it is Ahura and she is only a cadet. Uh, trying to give her the motivation to tackle this. That she is the linguist at the uh, waypoint and needs to figure out what's going on with this space egg. So, meantime, we see Spock and her trying to figure out this space egg, and her is obviously tense and nervous. And when she gets tense and nervous, she starts humming. And she's humming some type of song that she apparently learned back when she grew up in Kenya. And Eventually, during that humming and so forth, Spock and Ahura notice that there's a correlation between Ahura's song and the space egg and the comet kind of mimicking Ahura's song. Um, and that there's a correlation between music and math and the comet is responding to. Spock and Ahura then could proceed to sing some musical tones on various harmonics harmonics and frequencies and the space egg responds accordingly to these pitches and eventually drops the force field. Matter of fact even Una and Pike back on the Enterprise notice this same music correlation when Una notices a signal coming from the comet on sensors and plays it to Pike and it's a song from Kenya with Pike says well that can't be a coincidence. <laughs> anyway so then the force field drops and the landing party's back on Enterprise. And of course, you might guess it, that alien race called the Shepherds, they aren't pleased with this interference of Pike in the landing party, and they again start attacking the Enterprise. The Enterprise then responds and be able to temporarily disable their weapons to give them a time to come up with an idea or a plan. Spock then comes up with this idea 
that maybe they don't need to actually move the comet or do anything, but maybe nudge the comet without touching it. Uh, so the Enterprise then starts flying through a comet's tail debris field, which, by the way, I really like the, the visual effects on this. Seeing the Enterprise weave in and out from the space debris really was kind of cool, in my opinion. I liked it. They did that as a distraction so they could drop off Spock in a shuttle on one of the rocks in the debris field as the Enterprise keeps, Enterprise keeps flying through the debris field. Then, of course, they come to a point at the end of the debris field. Then they shut off all the systems and play dead when the Shepherds hail them again. And then they ask them for their help, uh, kind of giving a distraction to allow Spock to have time to fly close to the comet to nudge its trajectory enough to miss the planet. Because the comet is supposedly uh, got some type of intelligence to it. At least that's what Spock believes, and so does Pike, and that it's going to respond accordingly. So Spock then does something that I don't really like in this episode. It's it, I feel like it's, once again, something that the writers shouldn't be doing, but they are. Uh, we hear Spock laugh afterwards on comms from the shuttle. And this was in response to a saying that Pike said at the beginning of the episode that sometimes things get so bad enough that you just got to laugh. For me, I still have to feel that the writers are trying to take too many attempts to have Spock show emotions like they did in Discovery. Regardless that he is half human, in TOS, he didn't really show his emotions all that often. He did show them from time to time, but not as frequent as they, as these writers are making it seem. With him smiling in the first episode and then laughing uh, in this episode, I don't know. And a, a Vulcan's going to keep their emotions in check. I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, Bob. Maybe since he is an earlier version of Spock, and this is a young Lieutenant Spock, that he's still struggling with his emotions at times, keeping them suppressed. Maybe. But I believe if the writers really understood Vulcans, that he would have learned a long time ago when growing up on Vulcan how to use logic to suppress his human emotions. Since he did make a conscious choice to live by the Vulcan way of logic rather than embracing his human side. Doesn't mean that he might not have an emotion slip out or here and there, but he's going to have a lot firmer grasp on his emotions than what they keep portraying him as, as having. Anyway, so that said, I will say that several things are evident to me in this new series that are an attempt in my opinion, by the writers to return to a feel of original Star Trek, the OG Trek that I love. Like, one of my favorite things that I saw in this episode, and I've seen in, in the first episode as well, about Pike giving his captain's log, a supplemental captain's log, at the end of the episode. To me, this makes it feel more like old Trek than anything. So, let's wrap this up. Overall, I am liking the new Trek series of Strange New Worlds. It is still not, in my humble Penguin Trekkie opinion, as on par as OG Trek is, but it is definitely an attempt by the writers to show that they are making a conscious choice to make good Trek stories over pushing some type of agenda. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that the agenda is gone. It's not. The diversity in Trek is still everywhere in this show. You see it in all the characters and so forth. The woke and identity politics, in my opinion, in, in an agenda is still present in Trek. However, I do feel that it is more in the background and that it is more of an attempt by the writers to allow the story to come through more and give a more hopeful outlook, which to me, I really like. This little Trekkie penguin is glad to see this shift, finally. Albeit subtle, it is still a shift, in my opinion, in the right direction. Anywho, I hope you found something useful or entertaining in this review, and I hope you come back to check out more of my reviews and many of the other great ping, 
crazy penguin videos and podcasts that I have. If you like what you've seen or heard here, I hope you hit that like button and subscribe button with a fish slap it hard and show your support of this little Trekkie penguin and his content. And if you're so inclined, please feel free to share your thoughts and comments with me. I would love to hear your thoughts on all this, especially on this new Trek series, what you think about it and so forth. And as always, I'm the little Trekkie penguin named What About Bob, and I'll say, Kabrock!